Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the politics of sustainability. And I'm going to follow this outline, which I'll give you a second to absorb so you can orient yourselves. But I'm basically going to define the key terms here, talk about what we're up against, and then probe the political effort to do something about it, and what stands in the way of progress, and what sort of opportunities there may be for, for your generation. So let me start off with a couple of definitions. By now, all of you, probably much of the world, is familiar with the, the most common definition of sustainable development as development that need, meets the needs of people living today without reducing the capacity of future generations to meet their needs. And the most common way of thinking about what this means is, in term, it, it is, is shown in this diagram here on your right, the objective being to move our behavior towards the center where it is economically viable and sustainable, where it makes sense in terms of ecological imperatives and logics, and it's sustainable, and where it makes sense in terms of our understandings of, what, of what's fair, what's culturally appropriate, what makes us feel safe and secure, and what's sustainable. And we know that although much of the discussion over the past 25 years has been, has been from the perspective of the big changes taking place in our environment, increasingly, and this is both good and bad. People are talking about the sustainability of many social systems. Given the trajectory that we're on, can we afford this inexpensive public higher education, something we can afford? Or will we have to sacrifice quality or increase the cost, the tuition? Given that we have a population that is getting older, and we see the prospect of a significant number of our, of our, uh, of our citizens retired and living for many years. Is the healthcare system we have in place sustainable? Do we have the pension plans that we have in place sustainable? And an earlier speaker addressed this question. If people retire, expect to retire in their 60s, but live for 20, 30, 40 more years, how are we going to, what, what sort of arrangements will allow them to exist in a comfortable way, and so on, and so forth. You've read the news. Can we continue to provide people with easy access to credit and increase government spending? All of these things people have said may not be sustainable. Politics, sustainable, sustainability has many different ways of thinking about it. I've given you the most common ones. So does the term politics. But I'm going to focus on two dimensions of it. On the one hand, we're talking about a set of institutions that you all know, and they govern us. That's the Congress, in our case it's the Congress, it's the White House, the Presidency, it's the Judiciary, and all the various bits and pieces attached to those. And they govern us through sets of laws, and that's politics. Politics is about how those laws are made, and how they're interpreted, and how they're enforced, and what happens when you violate them. But from another perspective, politics is really about power. It's about how power is generated in our society. And it's about, about how it is used, how it gets to use it, what they use it for. So it's about public power being used in public ways. How do we mobilize power to achieve things that we want as a society? We want to be secure. We want a society that's fair. We want a society that develops and experiences progress. We want a society that takes care of people. How do we do this? How do we use the enormous amounts of power we have to do this? Well, there's a number of views about how this is done. For some people, we should think of power as an instrument. Power is, is an instrument. It's like it's a tool. And it serves, it's a tool that you use to advance interests. In many cases, maybe particular interests, the interests of some group in society. Ideally, everybody's interests are advanced in some way. 
But the idea is that we should think of it as, as simply a tool, a type of tool that we're able to, to use. So when we come together as a society, we have more power than we would on our own. More power to build roads, more power to build schools, more power to build hospitals than we would on our own. So it's a good thing to come together, combine forces, and use this to do things we couldn't do otherwise. So you can contrast it to what you could achieve on your own versus what you can achieve as part of a group. And no matter how industrious and innovative you are on your own, you couldn't build this type of society. Other people think of power, political power, as something that's more constitutive. That's to say it actually creates all those, that creates the culture that we're living in. So what we're doing with political power is we're creating culture. It's not just instrumental. This is, we're, we're crafting our identity here. We're crafting who we are. It's not the same as just building a road. We're building meaning. We're creating traditions. We're identifying collectively things that we want to be as human beings. It's constituent. We want to be people who are, what? Free, patriotic, equal who do good things. And we construct this by working together politically. And then for some people, power is, political power is actually really in the service of some deeper forces. And it's those deeper forces you need to understand. They may be economic forces. Political power is in the service of capitalism. They may be religious forces. Political power is there in the service of some grand divine scheme. That Maybe we understand, maybe we don't understand. But in this case, we'd be wrong to think this is a tool we can just use to do something, or that we're creating ourselves. Politics serves some, what's sometimes called spirit, an invisible hand, or some deeper force. What everybody agrees upon is political power, however you think about it, operates in a world a world that is already defined by certain practices, traditions, by culture, and a world that, ex that has all sorts of environmental pressures. And today we're going to focus on some of these environmental challenges. Not exclusively, but we're going to look particularly at those. So what are, what are we up against? Well, the list could go on forever, and already you're familiar with many aspects of it. The challenges include loss of land cover, it includes depletion of fisheries, the loss of arable land, disappearing reefs and wetlands, massive extinctions of species, climate change, a steep increase in disasters. Potentially, already today, I think in California, gas is $4 a gallon for some people, the rise in gas prices is inevitable. The era of cheap, abundant energy is over. There will be some little fluctuation, but the trend is towards more and more expensive energy, which is a problem for a society built on things like suburbs and commuting. And so on and so forth. So we have a big set of challenges. And one way of thinking about those challenges is that they exist in some measure because the things we're doing are not sustainable. So we have these daunting challenges because we're not acting in ways that are sustainable. So for a lot of people, the solution, what we have to do if we're going to confront those challenges is we have to move more of our behavior into this area where it's sustainable. And the task then is how do we do this politically? How do we move behavior that is unsustainable that's causing climate change, that's destroying species, how do we move it into a realm where it's sustainable and the pressure comes up? And how do we do this while well, simultaneously dealing with some very acute social problems like violent conflict and poverty? How do we 
juggle those two sets of goals, ecological and social, by changing the way we're acting? And can politics help us here? Well, there John McNeil's an environmental historian at Georgetown. He's written an interesting book about environmental history. And he said, well, and one of the arguments he makes is that can politics help us deal with these challenges? It depends a little bit about what, uh, what we think politics is. And there's a whole lot of different ways people think about what politics is, what it's informed by. And these different ways of thinking about politics, what it really, really is all about, shape its approach to the environment. I'll give you an example. I won't go through all of these. St. Augustine. Many people think of him as one of the three or four most influential writers for the thousand year period of the Middle Ages. So he had enormous, he left an enormous footprint on our thinking about the world. And he said, he made a very simple argument. What he was trying to do is try to explain the collapse of Rome, the collapse of the Roman Empire, which took place in, in the fifth century. And he said, what, what, what's going on here? And I said, what's going on, really? You only really understand if you look at it through a religious lens. What we did was we tried to rule ourselves. We tried to displease God. We doubted. And our punishment is politics. Politics is punishment for having the audacity to think that we could rule ourselves. We're not being ruled by God anymore, we're ruling ourselves. And we're ruling ourselves because we live in a state of sin, and we've been pushed out of the Garden of Eden into the state of nature. And what is nature about? Nature is about scarcity, it's about hunger, it's about thirst, it's about disease, it's about getting old, it's about dying. So we've been moved from a perfect situation to a profoundly flawed situation. Politics is because we're evil. And nature, nature is a punishment. So what do we do in that situation? Well, we focus on what's coming afterwards. That's what we have to ultimately focus on and not attach too much value to what's going on here on this earth. So we have to think about the, about the much longer future which awaits us, or hope that one day we'll be pushed back into the Garden of Eden. Well, if that's your conception that politics is a type of punishment, and that nature is a form of punishment, this is going to limit the options that you have. Is this view disappear? This is a view, a view which has informed large numbers of people for a very, very long time. Something dirty about the politics. Politics ends up with sort of sleazy people because it's sort of dirty anyways. Politicians are sort of dirty, sleazy, corrupt people. The whole area is sort of dirty, sleazy, and corrupt. And if that's your, if intuitively you sort of believe that, that politics is sort of dirty business, you're probably accountable with a civic guy. In very sharp contrast, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a key player in defining the type of politics that we have, said, said ideally, Politics is about emancipation. Politics is where we acquire things that other species don't. It's where we learn about things like dignity and civility. In society, we get to be great. And everything depends on the type of society that we have, and that depends on what we do politically. If we do the right things, we'll have a great society, we'll produce wonderful culture, We'll live lives of dignity and fulfillment. We'll have a strong sense of community and purpose. So politics is, 
crucially important to us. It takes us from the level that we would be in, in the state of nature and transforms us. And no other species has an opportunity to move out of the realm of instinct into the realm of choice. But we do something that not, nothing else on, on the planet does. We work together. And we envision wonderful things and we create them. And so on. John McNeil argues that not because it doesn't matter what we think politics is really all about, but other ideas that we create within the political space shape our relationship to the environment. And it looks at the big ideologies that define the 20th century, nationalist ideologies, which he links to notions of our country is precious, our country is important, we've got to protect our country. And in the US that meant things like national parks. We're a special place in this world. And we've got to protect this special place that is ours. We've got to pass it down to future generations of Americans. In Australia, they're saying the same thing. We live in this special place called Australia. And it's got a special type of beauty. And we've got to protect it and pass it down. Communism, on the other hand, he links to, we've got to make the environment more productive. We've got to bring more out of it. We've got to create more food, produce more food, build more houses, build more roads. Communism is about big projects, big transformative projects. And capitalism, an idea that our Capitalism, which is an idea deeply embedded in, in our political culture, assigns an enormous amount of value to improving economically, to growing our incomes, growing our material situation. So it matters. So, so these sorts of ideas affect the relationship that our society develops with its environment. Politics is also a space where we grapple directly with environmental concerns. And here again, a lot of, through history, when people thought about the environment and what sort of relationship their society should have to the environment, what they tended to, to conclude was the environment is, by nature, a sort of hostile and difficult place. We've got to tame it. We've got to domesticate it. We've got to change it into something that is better for us. And so, one society after another, for hundreds of years, set about the task of taking this environment and changing it into something better. And really, there was, this was not a, there was, there was very little sentimentalism about this. People cut down forests and they changed the direction of rivers and they changed coastlines. All with the objective of creating a space that would be more amenable to human needs, human aspirations, human potential. Now, we know that in recent years, this, this way of thinking has been challenged. And people have been trying to recast that relationship. It started really aggressively in the 1960s when people said, look at what we're doing to our environment, DDT. DDT was seen as one of the things that here we were covering the environment with a very lethal insecticide in order to reduce the number of insects out there, increase the productivity of our orchards and farms, and we had very little idea of what this meant. And all of a sudden we started discovering it meant 
massive health problems, enormous health problems. And we started to probe and we started to realize DBT was only one example of ways in which we were behaving that were coming back to cause damage to us, to affect our health, our prospects. So here we've been trying to, to reshape the environment to serve us, and we suddenly had people saying, we made some big mistakes. We had reshaped the environment in ways that weren't serving us very well, that were actually undermining our health, our welfare, our security. And this, as the scientific evidence built, this type of thinking got more and more urgent and alarming. And we know that in the 1970s, it led to our own government deciding, okay, we've got to take some aggressive measures, clean air, clean water, the Environmental Protection Agency. In the 1980s, the world climbed on board and produced that document to define sustainable development. In the 1990s, it crafted an agenda for the entire planet. This was the strategy to take the planet from where it was to that area of sustainability. And the plan was very carefully conceived, and everybody in the world almost agreed that it made sense and they would take it home and start implementing it. And in your generation, in the last 10 years, probably the pivotal event has been the release of assessment report number four about the state of the world's climate. And so today people think about environment, and they think about what we need to do politically about the environment very differently than they did 40 or 50 years ago. How do we bring about this change? Well, there's a number of things, to, elements that are important. To change how people think about something, to change people from thinking about, okay, it's okay to throw stuff out your car window as you're driving down the highway, to thinking, this is completely wrong, I'll never do it in my life, ever. That doesn't happen overnight. You have to find a way of relating that behavior that you don't want to the values that people have. You have to say, well, you believe in this, don't you? You, you value this. And so people found ways to listen. You value your health, don't you? You care about how the country looks, don't you? Well, the stuff you throw in gets washed down by the rains into your water supply and comes back to make you sick. And so people start to get those ideas. They start to realize, well, we can't do that anymore. It's in my interest not to do it. The fit is very strong. Litter is not just something that ends up on the side of the road and doesn't bother anybody. Litter is something that ends up on the side of the road and then gets washed down into our water system. That's a whole different thing. Changing people's minds, changing how we perceive things, depends a lot on how they understand the cost. If you say, I want you to, I want you to, you to, to agree that you'll live in a greenhouse, a house now, that's sustainable in terms of energy use and water use, in terms of the landscape, in terms of the materials. And if I say to you, you know, a house in Orange County today costs 600000 you can have a greenhouse for $6 million. A lot of you are going to say, well, that's, I'm no longer going to even think about that. Because the difference between 600000 and $6 is just too great. If I said you can have a greenhouse for the same price, then you might be much more receptive to listening to the arguments. So part of it depends on whether you think you'll be able to afford to make that change in your life. If I tell you we're going to increase tuition at UCI from the current whatever it is, 12,000, is it 12,000? Anybody know? So we're going to increase it to 60,000. How many of you would decide that you're going to come back with the children? Just one person? How many of you would 
predicted you may not come back next year. So we'd have to make a very powerful argument that that was that, that paying that extra amount, that extra forty-eight thousand dollars, was worthwhile and with, was in your interest. Fitting change to your values and to your sense of what you can afford depends on a lot of things. It depends on how the issue is framed, how compelling our evidence is, and it depends on people who are able to make these arguments. It also depends on the authority of the people who are going to stop, to challenge these arguments, who are going to say climate change is not real, who are going to say it's too expensive to move to alternative energy. We're going to say, if we do this, our economy will tank. So you can see what's happening in the political space here. One group of people saying, you want to do this, you need to do this, you can do this. And then you have other people saying, do you really want to do this? Do you really need to do this? And believe me, you cannot do this. It's not possible. Too expensive. You have regret it. For the past 20 years, we've had lots of these political entrepreneurs making the case for sustainability, linking it to our core values, showing us, trying to persuade people that you can manage this transformation, that it's possible, that it's something you can achieve. And today, arguably, people in this country, people in Europe, people in throughout Asia, in Africa, South America, are familiar with this concept, see some of the ways in which sustainability makes sense in terms of their values, are not persuaded that it's simply impossible, that it's simply unaffordable. So how successful has the effort of the past 20 years been? Well, it depends what you call success. There's a whole lot of ways, and this is one thing you need to be alert to. Many people claim success, but then you, when you look at the criteria you, they're using, they're not very compelling. So what is success? For some people, if it gets attention, that's successful. We're making the change that people are talking about. If the newspapers are covering these stories, if they're writing about it. Other people say, let's, let's look at money. Let's look at how much money is being spent on environmental rescue, environmental re restoration, green housing, energy efficiency. Let's look at the dollars that are going into this. How do people look at the polls? How many Americans care? How many people in Europe care? What do they care about? How many advocacy groups are there out there? How many laws have been passed? What sort of improvements have we seen? We've, after 20 or 30 years, 1970s, we passed the Clean Air and Clean Water, so 40 years later, are we healthier? Do we see, is our air clean? Is our water better? What sort of initiatives are taking shape? How deeply has this penetrated our educational system? Are school kids, do they understand climate change and biodiversity loss? Do they understand in grade 2, grade 8, grade 12? There's lots of things we can look at to, this, to see if we've made progress. Now, in 1992, we had the Rio conference, and we set up Agenda 21 and a plan to transform the world to a sustainable world. And in 2002, there was a whole round of efforts to measure the success of the first decade. In 2012, there will be a second major assessment of progress. 2012 will be a big year because it's called Rio Plus 20. And all over the world today, people are, are mobilizing for Rio Plus 20. So 2012 is going to be a very potentially exciting year where this issue gets a lot of attention and a lot of people weigh in on whether we've made progress and how we've made progress and what needs to be done. In the first assessment, in 2002, the reviews were very mixed. They were like a, you know, a mediocre movie. 
Like Star Wars. Or Harry Potter. Some good, some bad. But the overall, maybe not Harry Potter, right? But the overall, the, the preponderant view was that we were making very much progress. So in 2002, while well, we had some optimists who said, look how well we've been doing, overall, the general tenor of the assessment was, we've really done very little in that decade. And there's a, there's a concern that in 2012, people are going to look at the past 20 years and they're going to say, we still haven't done very much. Big difference between 2002 and 2012 is that in 2002, we thought we had a lot more time to make this transformation. My guess is in 2012, people are going to say, we're not making much progress and we have much less time than we thought. It's now becoming popular to say, the fate of the world is not going to be decided in 2100, which is what people were arguing in 1992. It's going to be decided by 2050. And if we haven't turned the corner then, we can talk about how complex systems collapse. One useful way of thinking about progress is with the concept I'm sure you're all familiar with already, the ecological footprint. When we look at the ecological footprint, it's pretty clear that at least in our own country, we're using an awful lot of natural resources to maintain our lifestyle. And that leads to a really simple question. Do we need all the crop that we're consuming? Do we really need it all? Is it really adding depth and value to our lives? Is a collection of a hundred Beanie Babies just incredibly more meaningful than a collection of zero Beanie Babies? Does it mean something to have six American Girl dolls on your dresser instead of one? Is it important to have special editions of every mediocre movie that's ever been released sitting somewhere in that drawer? We look at it and we say, well, we're, consuming. we're still consuming an awful lot, even though we know that's probably not good. And even though a lot of research asking about whether this consumption makes really, really improves the quality of our lives, a lot of the research around this question has determined that it probably doesn't. That really, what a, what, what a bigger, more recent, more luxurious car does in the grand scheme of things to the value of your life is remarkably small when you compare it to the cost. What a shopping spree really does. And you know, if, you're, if you've got no friends, there's always the mall, right? But it, you know, but maybe it would be better to have a friend. What's alarming, of course, is that those countries that are consuming a lot, the rich countries, are in many ways the models and aspiration of all the countries that are not consuming very much. And so when we look at the world view, we say, even though we're not sure that our high levels of consumption are that fulfilling, a lot of countries would like to move towards us. Now, I suppose in an ideal world, we'd move back a little bit, and other countries would move up a little bit. But in a way, we represent. We represent power, or we represent success, and we represent greatness. And we represent this too much of the world. And 
much as we would like to wear Nikes and drive Jeeps and go to Lakers games and stuff like that. So when we look at ecological footprints, we might come to the conclusion that we haven't made that much progress on sustainability because our ecological footprint hasn't reduced over the past 20 years. In fact, what we're doing is as we become more efficient, we're offsetting that by buying more stuff. So we may make more efficient cars, but now we have two or three of them. We may make more efficient houses, but we've doubled their size. We may use sustainable organic cotton to, to craft our blue jeans, but now we have ten times as many pairs as our grandparents had. So we're making great progress, but then we're offsetting that by buying a whole lot of those wonderfully efficient things. And we haven't moved. In fact, one could say we're moving in the wrong direction. We're consuming more and more and more. Why is that? There's lots of theories about why consumption has become so incredibly powerful to us. Much greater than it was in the two earlier generations of Americans. You can look here. Ecological footprint is a big, is a big measure. There's lots of attempts to take this big measure and divide it up into pieces and try and get a read on progress, not on that bird, not only from that bird's eye view, but in specific areas. And there's all sorts of interesting ideas about how we should be measuring success in our country. I'm not a big fan of SAT scores. I'll tell you, I did extremely well on my SATs. So it's not, it's not sour grapes on my part. But as a graduate student, I did a study of SAT scores, part of my statistical training. And my study and many other studies indicated they were pretty poor predictors of all the things that we might care about in life. It looked a little bit like a bit of a scam to have all these people taking these standardized tests because it wasn't really clear that they were predicting things that anybody cared about, although they were being used as predictors. Over the years, over the past 15 years, SAT scores have changed a little bit, SAT measures have changed a little bit, but lots of people think there's better ways of assessing educational potential better ways of assessing political engagement, and so on down the list. Lots of different ways. We talked in earlier about how we get locked into measurements. And measurements, once you've taken a certain measurement for a long period of time, there's a high cost of changing that. Because now, because you have historical data, you can say, look, how our income has improved, look how we've kept inflation under control, look how many more people we have graduating from grade 12. But it doesn't really matter how many more people we have graduating from grade 12. If they're performing less well than people graduating from grade 10, 50 years ago. And so some people would say, just saying that we've got more people graduating from grade 12 doesn't really tell us very much. Let's look at what that means. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you could say, well, our average grade 12 today is like a grade 9 50 years ago. So graduating more is not a great achievement. In fact, in this state, our educational system is not just at the bottom of the country, it's at the bottom of the advanced world. Not for you folks, you're the elite of a system. But for many people in California, the educational system is not producing people with skills that are very marketable compared to what they're doing in other countries and even in other states of this country. But we're the state that is more concerned with test scores than any other place on the planet. 
Have no longer prayed too long. We raised children in a culture of test taking and standardized test scores. And we reward schools that have lots of students who do well on lots of standardized testing. What we don't ask is, what does it matter? What does that measure? What does that tell us? People concerned with sustainability say we've got to think differently. And they say, so then when they look at, at the accomplishments of the past 20 years or so, I think almost everybody agrees that, that today we have a better sense of the problems. Every country has a better sense of its problems. One of the first steps of Agenda 21 was to do a national inventory. Where was your environment in danger? What was hurting in your environment? And pretty well every country on the planet did that. They went out there and they assessed the environmental situation. That makes sense as a starting point. First you assess it, then you develop some priorities, then you develop some strategies, and then you implement them. We were all good at the assessment part. We went around, we measured forest cover, we measured water flows, we measured amount of fresh water availability, and we measured rates of desertification, and we measured the health of coral reefs and wetlands. And we got a good overall impression that the world was in trouble. And a lot of countries followed that up with a conservation strategy. Another, the next step in, 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 in Agenda 21. So assess the situation and then develop a strategy. Some priorities, some ways of meeting those goals. And countries were pretty good at doing that. This meant we had a lot, more, a lot higher quality of information out there. We could talk more authoritatively of the environmental challenges that we're facing. And with all that information, large groups that might have been skeptical 20 or 30 years ago started to migrate towards this world here. Business, for example, started to talk about the triple bottom line. It wasn't just profit. It was profit that was good for the country and good for the environment. At least they started talking about it. Schools said, well, to study the environment, you have to have interdisciplinary programs like social ecology, where people could learn enough about economics and politics and ecology to make well-informed decisions and become leaders. We had this powerful framework, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biological Diversity, to, set, to, to deal with some of the most urgent problems. And we had tons of people in high schools, middle schools, primary schools, universities, organizing and taking on and saying, we're going to tackle one of these problems. And arguably, some of the big success stories economically in the world have grown, have grown, have developed using resources more efficiently than, than Europe and North America did. So we've made some gains, but we've also failed to make gains on a lot of fronts. World's population. In your lifetime, we'll probably very likely hit 9 billion unless something unexpected, some black swan event changes the trajectory that we're on now. Not, a, not, not the movie. Black swan event is a big catastrophic event that you can't predict. I don't know what the movie's about. One of the big challenges is that we and our, and our closest allies, like Canada, consume more and more resources. So while we've got this better information, and we've been leaders in generating this information, it hasn't slowed down our own consumption rates. That's a little bit strange. We've gotten bigger and bigger appetites, as we know. Because 70% of American men are obese, clinically obese, and have waist of larger than 40 inches. 70%. 40 inches. That's not just a little metabolic change in middle age. This is a, an ocean liner of fast food. On fast food, fast food, 
builds up massive quantities of fat in between the organs of your stomach. So that between all the various organs, you get huge clots of fat built up. So that, that, so that, that those big waistlines are because massive quantities of fat are now being stored bet between and among a person's vital organs. Well, this is not good for a whole lot of health reasons. It's not particularly aesthetically pleasing, but it's also not very healthy. And that fat, as it finds a home around your intestines, around your stomach, and around your liver, and so on, around your heart, that fat becomes very difficult to, to dislodge. It's like trying to wipe swine off a piece of sandpaper. Have you ever tried to wipe swine off a piece of sandpaper? It's really, really difficult. Try it. Put a big glove of slime and sandpaper and then wipe it off as hard as you can. Good luck. <laughs> As I said earlier, we made a wonderful efficiency gains, but population growth and higher levels of consumption are sort of offsetting those. Even in this age of recycling, remarkably, we discovered that many communities, when they introduced <coughs> recycling bins, actually produced more trash. So we've gotten the habit of, we now produce massive quantities of trash. Probably because we're consuming more. But also because we're so concerned about packaging. Things got heavily packaged. So it will be safe. So that nobody will doctor that basketball. Greenhouse gas emissions are, are increasing. We haven't, in the past decade, provided the leadership that we promised the world we would provide. Lawyers have found all sorts of ways to get around environmental laws. And the list continues. The list continues. New challenges like rapid urbanization are now being recognized as much more significant than we thought. And probably the single biggest thing that was not nearly as, as potent in 1992 as it is today is climate change. In 1992, it was a serious concern. Today, people are talking about the end of the planet being within our grasp. As a result of all this, yes, we've got better information, we understand the problem better, we know what we should be doing. But at the end of 20 years, the situation with fresh water has improved. Our ocean coastal areas are actually worse off today than they were in 1992 or 2002. Air quality has only improved in part of the world, and much of the world is much worse. Climate change worse, biodiversity loss worse. Forest cover worse for most of the world, and so on, and so on. So, so, and of course, the other thing that we've become much more aware of are the health costs related to living in environmentally compromised conditions. And now people are starting to explore. It's a slow process and it's a difficult and costly process. But they're starting to realize that exposure to certain types of pollution, actual pollutants related, related to things like car exhaust, but also chemicals that, that we freely spray around our house to keep things clean, most of which have never been tested for human health impacts. We discovered that, that, that the person who is spraying their countertop to kill bacteria day after day after day is probably doing themselves considerably more harm, weakening their immune system, strengthening bacteria, and exposing themselves to toxic chemicals. So in a sense, our systems seem to be becoming less resilient, less robust, more feed, weaker. 
Today, unless you're an MMA champion, just about anybody born 100 years ago could whip your butt. <laughs> We're a lot weaker than we used to be. We've got all sorts of problems. Asthma. It's not easy to determine what the causes of all these problems are in impotence. Learning disorders. But there's always, but many people believe there's probably a very strong environmental component to all of these things. It's not the only factor. Health is a product of many things. But the environment is a key element to it. So we have a shared planet. We understand how this planet functions. We understand many of its needs. But when we look at but how that's translated into, into change. The change has largely been conceptual and rhetorical. Things that we'd like to do, things that we believe we ought to do, but not necessarily things that we do do. Species are disappearing, emissions are increasing, water scarcity is flowing, poverty is entrenched. So the big question is, why hasn't our political system responded more effectively to this mountain of evidence that we're living unsustainably? What's happened? There's some big challenges, of course. One challenge is there's a whole lot of actors in a pluralist democracy like ours. We don't speak with a unified voice, even when we're all looking at the same information. We have a lot of chiefs and deploy this in different directions. And we see this when we look at things like the battles in Congress. Our top elected officials, it probably wouldn't be that inaccurate to say our top elected political officials, our political elites, our political leaders, operate in conditions of gridlock most of the time. So here we say, this is the best talent of our country, we want you guys to meet together and solve some of these problems and they communicate back to us saying, we can't. We can't agree on anything. We can't do anything. And that's a story we hear over and over again. We're stuck and we can't get out. Somebody needs to get our politicians one of those devices so they can call for help. I've fallen down and I can't get up. I'm a congressperson. Help me. And of course, they're buffeted by other types of leaders, social leaders and, and political leaders. There's other dimensions. There's spatial and temporal dimensions. One of the tricky things about environmental problems is they're not concentrated in Orange County or in California or in the U.S. They're interactive, they're dynamic, they're interdependent. They operate across a whole lot of different scales of space and time. It isn't like we're just trying to change Turtle Rock as a school. Turtle Rocks, whatever it's called. It's, we, once we start drilling into an environmental problem, we start to see it sprawl and move in all sorts of different directions. And that's very politically challenging. So we can sort of summarize the big obstacles, the big barriers to making progress in four easy points. And the first is that our system has become very complex. If anybody's familiar with network theory, we know that one of the things that that our technologies have done is they have created what we consider to be a very complex world, a world with a lot of parts. So a system is just something that has a whole lot of parts. And our world has more and more and more parts to it. Our lives have more parts to it. If you were born into this country a hundred years ago, born into the family farm with a couple of horses, and neighbors who had been there for generations, your life had a lot fewer parts. 
Our worlds are tremendously complicated. And we keep building more and more complexity into them. We join bigger and bigger networks. We're on Facebook and we're on something else. What else is there? Twitter. And we, how many people follow my tweets? Sign up. We're on Twitter. And we've got tons and tons of stuff. Computers and iPods and iPads and mobile phones and landlines and TVs and DVD players. And we're in HMOs that expose us to a dozen doctors. We don't just have one family doctor. For most of America's history, families had one doctor. That doctor was there when you were born. That doctor was there when you had chicken pox. That doctor was there when you almost died. Crew. That doctor was there when you had an allergic reaction. That doctor was there when you got married. That doctor was there when your kid was born. That doctor knew you, your family, the world you were operating in, how your parents were doing financially, how you were doing in school. Now we just enter vast, complicated systems where we spend most of our time asking, will you cover this? If I see this doctor, will I get reimbursed? How much? So 50% of the first visit, and 25% of the next visit, unless I see this other doctor, it's too complicated for us. The world is overwhelming to us. And we have really complex systems. They can be very, very daunting. And when the complex systems and the love and the parts that, are, that, are, that they're composed of, the enormous number of parts that they're composed of, are not ordered by simple cause-effect relationships, when the relationships are non-linear, then we feel like we've lost control of those systems. We don't know how to direct them. We don't know how to move them in a certain direction. So one problem is we can look at the United States, California, the world, the University of California, and say it's got too many complicated parts and too many non-linear relationships for us to say, here's our goal, we're just going to move over here in the next five or ten years. And some people are daunted by this. They say, the world's too much. I, can, I cannot make a difference in a world this complicated. I don't matter. I don't understand it. And if I do this, how do I know it'll help the poor kids in Africa? How do I know it'll make a difference? A lot of people convince themselves that, oh, well, I've just given myself a good pass, a get out of marriage free pass, or whatever it's called. <laughs> a pass, Las Vegas. A pass out of political engagement. That's not very compelling, though. Because what we're discovering, and I think all of you should at least be grounded in complexity science if you're not already so, is that these complex, non-linear, adaptive systems, they disclose patterns we can understand, and they present principles that allow us to move them in one direction, to get them onto a path that makes sense. They're daunting. It requires a lot more trial and error. Results aren't automatic and guaranteed. Things don't always work out as planned. But that doesn't mean we're helpless. In fact, there's all sorts of things we're learning about these types of systems that allow us to matter, to make a difference, to give it purpose and direction. Anybody who's stymied because the system seems too complicated, is locked into thinking that it's antiquated. It's time to join the 21st century and think about these problems, not in the terms of, of solutions that were designed for simpler systems, but in terms of the sorts of solutions that make sense for complex systems. And take advantage of networking and opening up channels of communication and building in diversity to optimize resilience and adaptive capacity and identify 
the small changes that have the larger systemic effects, and committing ourselves to failing in some of our efforts, knowing that some things will work and some things won't. Our institutions, however, are not likely to take on this challenge. One of the trouble with institutions is they've built up over the past 60 years was, you've got, was they become somewhat inert. It's hard to dislodge their budgets, it's hard to change their standard operating procedures, it's hard to change their goals. Recently, if you've been following national politics, you notice that the Department of Defense, the Department of State, have released big reports most recent one, the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, prepared by the Department of State in the USA, saying, we need to restructure, the world has changed, we need to restructure, we, it's a big complex place, we need to change, we can't, we can't be operating like we were in 1970 anymore, we've got to be different. So they're getting the message, but they don't tell us is how they're going to do that. Because they're all set up for a certain role. Right now, we, we sit there and we say we need to change our educational system, even as we prepare teachers for precisely that educational system. So we keep preparing people for the thing that we want to change. We get sort of locked into this. It's not easy. So there's, there's a lot of inertia. And, 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 and that's why we need entrepreneurs who are willing to shake things up, to cut against the grain, to say, Ah, uh, that's good, but I think I'm going to try to do it differently. I'm going to do it a different way. We've got political and economic time horizons and incentive structures that work against big changes, or even experimenting with changes. If you're a politician, you've got to be re-elected every two years, or four years, or six years, depending on the office you're running for. And you're spending a lot of time thinking about I'm going to only take on programs and projects and so the guy that I can get a result out of in a year or so. Why should I bother with anything else? Because when I go, when I run for election again in 18 months, I want to be able to say, well, I did this and this and that. Now, this and this and that, as we know, as Jerry Brown has just said, hey, there's so many. You know, every, everybody in Congress is a, in, 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 in Sacramento is able to introduce, I forget the number, I think it's 12 pieces of legislation and everyone does it, and they're all little bits and pieces of legislation that they all have to be taken seriously, let you know. And he's looking and saying, this is ridiculous. This is a big, massive waste of time. But all these people elected in California, they've got big problems, and they've all introduced these little tiny bill, bills to sort of position themselves for the next, their next campaign. And we've got to get this energy, this vitality, this intelligence behind some bigger problems. But if you're an individual politician, you say, how is that going to help me? When I go to my electorate and they say, what did you do in the last two years? And if I say, well, I got new stop signs for the whole community. That's pretty good, isn't it, guys? I introduced a cat spin program. Now, cat spin. <laughs> it's probably not a trivial piece of legislation. And then there's the big one consumer behavior. For this one, there isn't that much excuse. For this one, we know at an individual level the sorts of decisions that probably mostly make sense. And we know the sorts of decisions that probably mostly don't make sense. And when we look at our country, we're not making the ones that make most sense. So, we're lost. so we've got these, these, these big obstacles that are holding us back. And when people look at this situation, they say, here's our challenges, they're big, and here's what we've achieved over the past 20 years as these challenges have become urgent, and it's more and more people have accepted that we need to do something, and that's modest. And here's some of the reasons why we're not making as much progress as we probably need to. People say, and here's what lies in store for us, or here's what we need to do. Dan Duden, 
And I do, you know, these, these are Johns Hopkins, very popular. I think he, he was one of the most popular professors of Johns Hopkins. The most popular professor and the most notable on the campus. He wears only black now. He's a very big, big guy. He wears big hats. And he also carries two backpacks. And he says the only way we're going to get around this is by moving towards some form of world government. He says there's one system in the world that could be, that, that, that could be a model for world government, that's the American system, the Republican system of the, of the United States. And he says we need to find a way to scale this system up because these global problems require, we have, we have global environmental challenges, and we have a global economy, but we don't have any global governance structure that works. And that's the missing element. Now that we've recognized the problems are shared and our economic relationships are, have put us in a situation of interdependence, we need to find a governance structure to match. Interesting idea, the challenge of course is how do we get from where we are to there? And it's not a small challenge. It's, in fact, it's such a big challenge that a lot of people have lined up with the views of Thomas Homer Dixon, who wrote books like The Ingenuity Gap and The Upside of Down. And he said, says, listen, world government might make sense. It's true we have a globalized economy. It's true we have a, a shared environment, a planetary environment. Probably, theoretically, we need a governance structure that, that can be aligned with problems on that scale. But we're never going to get there. Smaller government structures are not going to solve those problems, and so there's only one likely outcome, global catastrophe. So what's going to happen over the next 40, 50, 60 years is breakdowns. We saw the Soviet Union collapse. We saw bits and pieces of our own country collapse, collapse around the economic crisis, collapse under the effects of Hurricane Katrina, we discovered that actually, we don't really know what to do when something big happens. We don't know what to do. We couldn't even save a few thousand lives in New Orleans. We had no capacity to predict the economic crisis, and we were completely unsure of how to respond to it. And, and Homer Dixon says, those problems are only getting bigger, deeper, more aggressive. We couldn't solve them in bite-sized forms, we're not going to solve them on larger scales. Africa, Northern Africa, is collapsing under the weight, not just of corrupt regimes, but of not enough water. Food prices that are too high. People are sitting there, they can't survive. And there's no easy fix to water scarcity and high food prices. You can get rid of Gaddafi, Maybe you can get rid of Gaddafi. I don't know. You can try to get rid of him and bring somebody else in. They're not going to be able to wave a magic wand and provide everybody with water and food overnight. So Homer Dixon looks and he says, the collapse in the Soviet Union, the collapse in Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, already collapsed. South Asia, on the verge of collapse. America experiencing many, many collapses and not being able to manage them very well. This is getting worse and worse and worse. We're not reading those signs. We're looking and we're saying, hey guys, the economic impact of floods has tripled in the past year. And that means we're moving on to breakfast. And we're, then we're saying, what's on TV tonight? So we're getting the messages, but we're not doing anything about it. And so he says, you guys are going to have an interesting challenge of rebuilding from a global catastrophe. That'll be what you get to do. Early, the, the great generation of the country rebuilt from World War, you're going to get to be rebuild from global catastrophe, at least the six of you who are left. Hope you like each other. David Bornstein, David Bornstein brings a much more optimistic perspective. 
Dave Bornstein says, we've got to, it's, yeah, governments are not, there are some problems with governments. They're in gridlock. Their jurisdiction and capacity doesn't seem to have line up very well with the sort of problems we have. That's all true. But we've got to look at other things outside government. We've got to look at where is the real energy of the next generation going. It's not going into Washington. It's going into all sorts of initiatives and networks and experiments outside of formal politics. It is the realm of social entrepreneurs, which Homer Dixon and Dudley don't even talk about is the realm of social entrepreneurs that are going to decide the fate of the planet. And as these guys experiment, these men and women, they experiment with microfinance, and they experiment with drip irrigation, and they experiment with wind farms, and they experiment with green companies, and they experiment with one thing after another. Every once in a while, they hit a home run. They find something that works really, really well, and it catches on. And it changes that. And this process is very new. But as it grows, we're going to have a lot of home runs over the next 20 or 30 years. You people are going to be hitting those home runs. They're going to change the course of the planet. It isn't going to be changed from DC. It's going to be changed by transnational networks that aren't daunted by the complexity of the problem. They aren't locked into standard operating procedures. They aren't trying to protect their budgets and their jurisdictions. But are simply asking afresh, how do we deal with this? What do we have to do to, do to build a house better? What do we have to do to get people from point A to B better? What do we have to do to make health more affordable? What do we have to do to ensure that if you live to be 90 or 100, you won't be living with two other people in one room eating cat food. What do we have to do? And Bornstein is your champion. He looks and says, you guys have so much talent, so much capacity, so much passion. You're not afraid. You're not afraid to try things. You're not afraid. You're not worried that you might try something and might bomb because you just said, I learned and I picked up and I moved ahead. So he's very optimistic. Is he going to prove right? We don't know because we don't yet have a critical mass of social entrepreneurs who are making difference on that scale. But what we have is something that looks like it's growing very, very quickly. And it's growing quickly because it's working. And sort of related to this, of course, is the, world, is the view of people like Richard Branson, Bill and Melinda Gates, Pierre Maggiore, successful business leaders who believe that they can harness their skills, their vision, their understanding of how to manage people, mobilize support, market, brand, get from point A to point B. That they, they've got these skills and, they, and they're going to bring them to bear on the world's problems. And they're not beholden to any electorate. They don't have to campaign for office. They don't have to be politically correct. Diplomatic protocols don't hold them back. They can say what they want. They can do what they want. And if enough of them tackle these problems, then they're going to be a big part of the solution as well. So you can look at it very bleakly, and you can sort of say, you can sort of say, you're right, governments are failing, the logical step for government probably isn't going to happen, and we're in trouble. Or you can look at it very optimistically and say, the buck doesn't stop there in the White House, it stops here on the campus. This is where change starts, this is where change gathers momentum. This is where change will make a difference. And if we sit around hoping somebody else will do it for us, then we'll be talking about Tad Homer Dixon as the prophet of the 21st century. So how do we do this? What's, what side do we take? Where do we position ourselves? 
Well, political engagement no longer simply means lobbying on behalf of somebody who's running for, for, for elected office, you know, handing out buttons and bumper stickers, trying to get people to register to vote. That's a sort of old school model of what political engagement means. Political engagement, however, even when we transfer it out of that old school into the, into the 21st century, where it simply means generating power to tackle public problems for the public good, to make our world a better place. And it doesn't have to be generating power to get elected in Sacramento or DC, but generating power for the public good. You're still going to run into the traditional problems of people having different views. There's still going to be tensions and, and there's still going to be disagreements. There's still going to be lots of periods of frustration. But there's also enormous, enormous opportunities to do the things that need to be done, to identify needs, to use social media and IT and so on to educate, create awareness, mobilize support, to open up all sorts of new structures to deliberate, to debate, to discuss, to do research together, to collaborate, to, to say, we're, we're invisible children and we're going to move in this direction and we don't care what people tell us works or doesn't work. We're playing for change and we're going to move in this direction and we don't care about what people tell us will and will not work. These organizations that change the world are organizations that are built on passion, and confidence, and the belief that they've got the opportunity, that they've got the tools, and they're going to matter one way or another. And they're not looking for somebody else to guide them. They're not looking for somebody else to support them. And they're becoming clever in figuring out how to sustain themselves, how to build support for themselves, how to how to monitor their own impact on the world, how to make sure that they are making the difference they want to make, how to scale themselves up so that other people can copy their successes, how to decide when, unlike your average congressperson or university professor, they're able to say, it's time for me to leave. I've done what I can do, it's time for me to pass the torch to the next round of passion, the next area of energy, the next bit of momentum. I did my part and I'm handing the baton to the next guy. Because of course, professors and politicians and so on stay in place forever, long after they've fallen asleep. They're still there, like, I'll be here, just come back to my class in 15 years, I'll be sitting there saying, God knows what. Anything that comes to my mind. So we need the political leaders, we need the economic leaders, but today we especially need the social leaders. We need those people. An earlier speaker talked about how important it was to get political leads and economic leads in alignment if we were going to solve problems like economic crisis. I want to suggest that there's another group that's important, and that's us. But sure, it's good that Obama and Bernanke agree on something. That's great. And that'll probably be a good message to send to the world, and so on. But ultimately, ultimately, whether you're able to retire comfortably or not is going to depend on decisions you make, not on the decisions that they make. Whether you remain healthy for most of your life or not is going to depend largely on decisions you make, you make, not what they make. So there's an important role to be played by everybody who has, who exists in this privileged situation of being young and vital and part of a country where you can do what you want. And you come with a whole set of tools that can, that can support you and anybody else. Because we are learning, as I mentioned earlier, how to manage complex systems and how to deal with a world 
with lots of uncertainty. We've got all sorts of clever tools for educating people who maybe don't understand or have not yet processed the information. Because information is overwhelming to a lot of people and they need educators who can pick up from this massive cascade of information and identify patterns and things that are important that you need to know. And you can do that. You need people who are going to walk the walk. We have everybody in our country talking the talk. 95% of Americans say that they believe we have environmental problems and they believe more needs to be done. And they believe that they're not doing it. That's why I think it's so important. All of you should be identifying personal sustainability projects, things that you are going to do. Who cares what anybody else thinks? You are going to be a vegetarian once a week. You are going to walk to the campus once a week. You are going to take public transportation once a week. You are going to give half your money for this month to somebody else who needs it more. You are going to take on little projects that make a difference. And build up that credibility so that when you're running some large company or some large nonprofit, you can, people will say, I trust this guy. I trust this person. Because she's lived that way. I have no doubts about this person. Look at how she has lived her life. And that gives you the sort of credibility to, to you folks. You understand IT better than anybody else. How to mobilize support, get your message across, connect. Connect across boundaries that in the past seemed unbridgeable. Now we can reach anybody in the world at any time. We can engage anywhere. And we can use this consumption, to the decisions about what to produce in the country are largely linked to that part of the population that we believe to be the biggest consumers. And the, that part that we believe to be the biggest consumers for the next 20 years are the people who are in high school and university today. Those are the people the producers want to satisfy. Those are the people the producers want to attract and to create loyalty with and brand identification with. They want you to make the decision, are you going to Get a Vespa or a Hummer. Because if you're all going to buy Vespas, they're going to make very, very cool Vespas over the next 10 years. But if you're all going to buy Hummers, then nobody's going to make any Vespas. They're all going to make Hummers, and they'll be pretty cool as well. They'll cater to what you want. That's a tremendous amount of power. Because they know that all the wealth of the country is going to flow through your hands for the next 20 or 30 years. It's all going to flow through your hands. You're going to decide how almost every dollar is spent. And so everybody in the world wants to please you. They want to get the genes right. They want to get the computers right. They want to get the cars right. They want to get the houses right. So if you tell them what you want, that's what they'll build. If you say, guess what? We're never going to buy a home. Not any of one of us. But every one of us is going to want a vessel. Bang. It changes. Because the people over, because the older generation are losing their significance as consumers. Your generation is moving into its own. You've got the, you got the economy in a submission hold. And it's about to tap. There's all sorts of good ideas about there about how we can set goals that make sense to large numbers of people. Factor four, for example, produce twice as much with half as much. That's a good idea. It's an easy concept. You could apply it to a whole lot of things in your life. You could apply it to the business world, the hospital world, the educational world, in your own home. Produce twice as much with half as much. The triple bottom line. And we can use, and we can learn. We, know, we now know that there's a lot of information stored, still stored in nature that we haven't yet tapped. 
and that we can continue, that it continues to make sense to study the natural environment, to look for cues about how to do things better and more efficiently, because nature has some wonderful designs, designs that we can imitate. We understand now that we should be thinking about designs that go from cradle to cradle, the products that are, we should be thinking about producing stuff. <coughs> a these capacities that can be customized and repurposed and not just discarded. And it's the repurposes, repurposing of things which will make our society vital and energized. It's a type of renaissance period that we're entering, where everything is on the table again, where we can rethink everything. Imagine how exciting it must have been to be sitting around with Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael and Donatello and Lorenzo Lotto and all these people as they completely rethought the world, the entire world. As they said, we're, we are shedding the weight of the past and we are going to take a fresh new look at everything. How we build things, what we consider to be beautiful, how we produce anything. What an exciting period of time. You're on that threshold again. It's the Renaissance period. It's not the end. It's not the end of America or the end of civilization. It's like, it's like the most exciting time. Because you have the most powerful tools and you have the biggest problems. And nothing, nothing creates the conditions for greatness better than big problems and powerful tools. And you're not afraid, you're at that point in your life where once you get over 40 or 50, experimenting with your life is, becomes a little bit of a challenge. You've got kids that depend on you, you've got a mortgage payment. You can't just change direction dramatically. But from 20 to 30, to 20 to 40, you can do whatever you want. And you can fail that and pick yourself up and move on again. And you can fail at that and pick yourself up and move on again. That's the beauty of being in this country, is that you can fail forward. And that's what we need, lots of people experiment. Because every once in a while those experiments will throw up a winner, and that winner will quickly, using social media and other techniques, be scaled up, and everybody will be doing it better and more efficiently. So the future has tremendous opportunity. I think we can look at the world and we can be very, very alarmed because the trends are deeply alarming and it looks like we're running in the wrong direction on so many issues. That's, there's, and that's true. We are not making the sort of gains, we have not made the sort of gains that we're hopeful. And people like myself who thought in the 1990s, we we're going to change the world. We were naive and we didn't realize how much resistance we would face and how difficult that was going to be. But, do we come to the conclusion then that all we've got ahead of us is disaster, catastrophe, and violence? If that's, that, that's, that that's, is that the message I want to communicate to all of you? That that's your future? Not at all, because first of all, I don't believe it. I don't think that's the future at all. I think it's easy to convince yourself that that could be the future. But it sharply discounts the ingenuity, the resilience, the passion that we have an enormous stock of in people like yourselves. And so I think that, that, that the one message I would take from this course that I would hope you would take is that you are on the threshold and you, have, and you are the natural group of people to assume the mantle of what, in a hundred years from now, people will look upon as an act of global greatness, stepping up to challenges that an earlier generation lost traction on, could not solve, were overwhelmed by, and began to convince themselves nobody could solve, everybody will be overwhelmed by, these are too complicated for anybody. But just because an older generation is seeing that doesn't make it true. So I think that you should, you should, if you take one thing, it should be a sense of, of hopefulness. 
because the capacity, in my experience, is unprecedented for tackling problems that are unprecedented. And so I want to close this lecture with a little film which ought to make you feel proud because it's about you folks. <laughs>